The annals of Clown McNoise describe Cormac McCart as, quote, absolutely the best king that ever reigned in Ireland before himself. Wise, learned, valiant and mild, not given causelessly to be bloody as many of his ancestors were. He reigned majestically and magnificently, end quote. With an introduction such as this, we should probably spend a little bit of time getting to know this great man named Cormac McArt. The Lower Gavala Erin, the Book of the Takings of Ireland, dates his reign at 161 to 180 AD, or during the same era of the Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius. Geoffrey Keating, on the other hand, in his Forest Fiasa Heron, dates his reign to 204 to 244 AD. And the Annals of the Four Masters give it as around 226 to 266 AD, while the Annals of Ulster date his death as late as 366 AD. While the tales of his legacy are infused with myth and fable, and while the true dating of his life isn't even clear, he is generally regarded to be a real historical personage, or at the very least, a composite of real figures. Further to his kingly qualities, he is also famous for his role as the ruling High King during the Fenian cycle of Irish myth, making him a contemporary of the hero Fionn McCool. Many mythic symbols and motifs have been attached to this man, which, while are obvious fictions, only serve to highlight his greatness as a king. Cormac was the son of King Art, the Lonely, Macoon, and the grandson of Con of the Hundred Battles. So, in addition to MacArt, Cormac was also referred to as Cormac Ucoon, the grandson of Con, in respect for his heroic grandfather, and also known as Cormac Ulfada, or Longbeard. He ruled for 40 years from, as we said, around 218 to 254 AD at the Hill of Tara, and Ireland prospered during his reign. Throughout the myths we see the idea repeated that rule by a good king would have an effect on the produce of the crops, the fertility of the land, and the good fortunes of the people, whereas a bad king would produce a failure of crops, hardship, and burdens on his people. Another kingly taboo which we have already mentioned precluded someone from being king if they were blemished, and we see a scenario highlighting this play out in Cormac's life when he is blinded by an arrow in battle. Clearly blemished, Cormac is now unfit to rule according to Ireland's very old customs and traditions of kingship. He abdicates his kingly duties and the throne goes to his son, Carbulifacha, who would famously reject the Fina warriors of Fionn McCool and rise against the warrior guild in the Battle of Gowra. Cormac is always described as a champion of learning and it is said he founded three important schools at Tara, one for history, one for poetics and one for military training. It is Cormac who is credited with introducing the first mill in Ireland, marking him out as a man with vision and of industry. And he is also described as a great lawgiver, a just man, who had a head for fairness and a good judgment that would rival King Solomon's. He is even credited with producing an important legal manuscript called the Book of Ackle. It deals with compensation in cases involving harm to an individual's person, such as an injury to the eye, for example. Interestingly, however, Cormac is said to have turned to the Christian faith in his later life, having been the third man in Ireland to hear about the prophet from the East before St. Patrick arrived on the island. As such, as a symbol, Cormac doesn't just represent the ancient pagan past, but rather he is more of a bridge figure between the old ways and the Christian ways. Here we find Ireland's, quote, best king that ever reigned, end quote, acting as a midwife, by sanctioning the new myths of Christ. He refused to consult the Druids or to worship the images which they made as emblems of the immortal ones. Sober accounts of his death say he choked on a salmon bone in later life while living near Slain. However, the magical accounts say he was killed by the she or fairy folk to punish him for turning away from them and to the new Christian god and other interpretations say his choking on the bone was the result of a druidic curse which was placed upon him for the same reasons. Cormac's dying wish was that he not be buried at the customary royal resting place at Brew on the Boyne, which is Newgrange, along with his ancestors, because, quote, all these kings paid adoration to gods of wood or stone, or to the sun and the elements, 
but he had learned to know one God, immortal and invisible, end quote. Instead, he favoured the sight of an east-facing hill at Rosnery, so he could await the coming of the light of the world, the Son of God. But upon his death, his wishes were disregarded. It was discussed and agreed by the living that he should be interred with his father and grandfather at the brew. The legend continues that upon trying to bury him, the waters of the river Boyne rose up three times to oppose them, and in one account eventually carried the coffin off downstream to Rosnery, where he was finally put to rest.